Hello and welcome back to part 4 of this video series on why the pre-tribulation rapture is a false doctrine. In this video, we will look at the passages in the Gospel of Mark and Luke as they relate to end times and the rapture. First, we will start with Mark chapter 13. We will see how Mark and Luke are very similar to Matthew chapter 24 that we discussed in my last video and in some places corresponds to almost verse for verse. There are, however, some differences, as we will see. So let's get into it, starting with Mark chapter 13. The first major difference is the question that the disciples ask Jesus at the beginning of the chapter. As Jesus is coming out of the temple, he comments about the temple and the great buildings there. Mark 13 verse 2, Jesus said to them, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another which will not be torn down. The disciples then ask him the following question in Mark 13 verse 4. Tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled? Note that the word parousia does not occur in Mark chapter 13. The disciples do not ask Jesus about his coming. The word coming occurs twice in this chapter, but both times it is used as a verb. The Greek verb erkomai is used in Mark chapter 13, translated as coming. Nevertheless, many of the major points brought out in Mark chapter 13 are identical to Matthew chapter 24. The early signs when all these things will be fulfilled are noted in Mark 13 verses 6 through 8 which corresponds to Matthew chapter 24, verses 5 through 8. They are false Christs, wars, famines, and earthquakes. Once again, Jesus groups these together and compares them to the beginning of birth pangs. Also, the use of the pronouns you and they is the same in Mark 13 as it is in Matthew chapter 24. When Jesus uses the pronoun you, he is talking to or referring to people who are his disciples. When he uses the pronoun they, he is referring to people who are not his disciples. One difference occurs in Mark 13, 9 through 11, corresponding to Matthew 24, verse 9. In Matthew 24, 9, after Jesus describes the beginning of birth pangs, he tells his disciples, they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you and you will be hated by all the nations on account of my name, is mentioned at Mark chapter 13, 9 through 11 there. Let's go ahead and read those verses. It says, But be on your guard, for they will deliver you to the courts, and you will be flogged in the synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake, as a testimony to them. The gospel must first be preached to all the nations. When they arrest you and hand you over, do not worry beforehand about what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but it is the Holy Spirit. Another difference occurs in Mark 13, 12 through 13, which corresponds to Matthew 24, 10. In that verse, Jesus says, At that time many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. In Mark 13, 12 to 13, the phrase, many will fall away, is not specifically mentioned. However, there is much more detail given about those who betray one another. Let's read Mark 13, verses 12 through 13 there. It says, brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but the one who endures to the end he will be saved. Next, the abomination of desolation is described in Mark 13, 14, which corresponds to Matthew 24, verse 15. Mark 13, 14 says, But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be, let the reader understand. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. If we compare Matthew 24, 15, it says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. The word standing where it should not be replaced the words standing in the holy place in Mark there. The next difference occurs in Mark 13 verse 19. In this passage, when Jesus describes the period after the abomination of desolation, 
He does not use the specific phrase, a great tribulation, as he did in Matthew 24, 21. However, the words that Jesus uses to describe this period are otherwise similar to those in Matthew 24, 21 and in Daniel 12, verse 1. Mark 13, 19 says, For those days will be a time of tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the creation which God created until now and never will. And once again in Mark 13, 20, corresponding to Matthew 24, 22, Jesus states that those days of tribulation have been shortened for the sake of the elect who will still be on the earth at this time. Mark 13.20 says, Unless the Lord had shortened those days, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. Then in verse 21, corresponding to Matthew 24.26, Jesus uses the pronoun you, referring directly to his disciples who will still be on the earth during this period. Mark 13.21, And then if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or behold, He is there. Do not believe him. It's important to note, once again, that in Mark 13, verses 5 through 23, Jesus uses the pronoun you 14 times. And in each instance, the pronoun you refers to his disciples who are on the earth. But in Mark 13, 26, corresponding to Matthew 24, 30, Jesus switches from the pronoun you to the pronoun they, when he describes the people who will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Mark 13, 26, Then they, speaking of those who are not his disciples, will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Just as in Matthew 24, Jesus' disciples will no longer be on the earth to see him coming in the clouds because they will be caught up to meet the Lord at the rapture. Then in Mark 13, verse 27, we see the last major difference corresponding with Matthew 24, 31. In Mark 13, 27, it says, And then he will send forth the angels and will gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of heaven. As Jesus describes the final part of the rapture, when the angels will gather together his elect, he uses the phrase, from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of the heavens. This phrase replaces from one end of the sky to the other in Matthew 24, 30. This one phrase confirms that Jesus is not just talking about gathering his elect from the sky, but also from the farthest end of the earth as well. It refutes the notion that this gathering of his elect is from those previously in heaven only, as pre-tribbers believe. Finally, after examining the entire chapter of Mark 13, we conclude that although there are some minor differences in specific verses, the overall meaning is the same as in Matthew chapter 24, and the conclusion that the rapture will occur at the second coming of Christ is confirmed. Now let's take a brief look at Luke chapter 21. Although the rapture is not specifically referenced or described in Luke 21, Jesus does describe his return to earth in this chapter, and within the text of Luke 21, additional information is supplied about events leading up to his return. In Luke 21, 8-11, the early signs are once again listed, which are false Christs, wars and disturbances, nations rising against nation, plagues, famines and earthquakes. However, in addition, terrors and great signs from heaven are included in Luke 21, verse 11, something which is not mentioned in Matthew 24 or in Mark chapter 13. Another notable difference is that the abomination of desolation is not mentioned in Luke chapter 21. However, Jesus gives us new information about events on the earth that will be happening at this time. In Luke 21, verse 20, it says, When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. There's also new information in Luke 21, 24, where it says, And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. We know there was a surrounding of Jerusalem in in the year 70 when the Romans surrounded the city, but this is speaking about the future time during the tribulation period when the nations come against Jerusalem again and the Gentile nations will dominate her. 
This verse in Luke 21, 24 corresponds with Revelation 11, verse 2. In that passage, the Apostle John is instructed to measure the temple, but to leave out the outside court because it has been given to the nations, or to the non-Jewish Gentiles, who will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months, or three and a half years. Jerusalem is the holy city, so in Luke 21, 20 through 24, We learn that Jerusalem will be surrounded by armies and subsequently trampled underfoot by the Gentiles. And also in Revelation 11-2, we learn that this will be for 42 months, or a a three-and-a-half-year period. This is the time period that the Bible calls Jacob's Trouble, which occurs during the Great Tribulation period. Luke 21, 20 through 24, let's just read those. It says, When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains, and those who are in the midst of the city must leave, and those who are in the country must not enter the city. Because these are days of vengeance, so that all things which are written will be fulfilled. Woe to those who are pregnant, to those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress upon the land and wrath to this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Again, Revelation 11.2 says, Leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. So, what are the times of the Gentiles? In Luke chapter 21, verse 24, Jesus speaks of future events, including the destruction of Jerusalem and his return. He says that Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. A similar phrase is found in Romans 11, verse 25, which says, A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Does the Bible tell us what the phrase times of the Gentiles means? The Old Testament does not contain this exact phrase, but there are references that seem to match up. Ezekiel chapter 30 verse 3 points to a time of doom for the nations in connection with the day of the Lord. Daniel's series of visions deals with Gentile world powers and their role in God's plan for the earth. Nebuchadnezzar's image of gold, silver, bronze, iron, and clay in Daniel chapter 2 verses 31 through 45 represents successive Gentile kingdoms that will dominate until Christ returns and establishes his reign on the earth. Daniel's vision of the four beasts in Daniel chapter 7 likewise speaks of four kings or nations which will dominate for a time until Christ comes to rule forever. The vision of the ram and the goat in Daniel chapter 8 gives even more detail about these Gentile rulers and the time involved in their dominion. In each of these passages, the Gentiles have dominion over the world, including the Jewish people, for a time. But God will ultimately subdue them all and establish his own kingdom once and for all. Each prophecy culminates with a reference to Christ's kingdom, so the times of these Gentile rulers would be all the years between the Babylonian empire of Nebuchadnezzar and the glorious return of Christ to establish his kingdom. As we know, Jerusalem was completely destroyed by Babylon in the year 587-586 BCE, so that's when the Gentile times began. This era of Gentile domination will end at the second coming of Christ when the Messiah will take up the throne of David as prophesied in Jerusalem, which will put an end to the Gentile rulership forever. When we examine the book of Revelation, we find similar references to the time of Gentile dominion ending with the return of Christ as we read in Revelation 11.2. The 42 months mentioned there refers to the Great Tribulation period of three and a half years when the Antichrist is revealed and begins his short rule over the world. The armies of the beast, or the Antichrist, are destroyed by the Messiah mentioned in Revelation chapter 19, verses 17 through 19, just before the millennial reign of Christ is initiated on the earth. 
Looking again at Luke 21:24, we see that Jesus mentions the time in which Jerusalem is under the dominion of Gentile authority. As I said before, Nebuchadnezzar's conquest of Jerusalem in 586 BCE began that period, and it has continued through to the present time. Romans 11:25 gives us a hint as to God's purpose in the times of the Gentiles, the spread of the gospel throughout the whole world. One theme of Romans chapter 11 is that when the Jewish people rejected Christ, they were temporarily cut off from the blessings of a relationship with God. As a result, the gospel was given to the Gentiles, and they gladly received it. This partial hardening of the heart for Israel doesn't preclude individual Jews from being saved, but it prevents the nation from accepting Christ as a Messiah until his plans are finished. When the time is right, God will restore the entire nation, and they will come to faith in him once again, ending the times of the Gentiles. Isaiah chapter 17 and chapter 62 also refer to this. Many of the prophets in the Old Testament foretold the restoration of the Jewish people at the day of the Lord. So God is not finished with his people yet. The Apostle Paul supports this at Romans chapter 11 verse 26 where he says, And in this way all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The Deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. The teaching of replacement theology, or supersessionism as it is called, is a false teaching, because the Bible is clear that God will restore a remnant of Israel during the period called Jacob's Trouble, which I mentioned earlier, which will take place during the Great Tribulation, where many Jews will return to Christ and repent. Replacement theology also holds that the universal Christian church has replaced ancient Israel completely as God's true Israel, and that Christians, including Gentiles, have replaced the biological bloodline of ancient Israelites as the people of God. So, to teach that Gentile Christians have replaced the Jews completely is a false teaching that's very common in the Christian world today. Getting back to Luke, in Luke 21, 25 through 26, corresponding to Matthew 24, 29, and Mark 13, 24 through 26, Jesus once again informs us that the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Luke 21, 25 through 26 confirms this. Under the return of Christ, it says, There will be signs in the sun and moon and stars, and on the earth dismay among nations, in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, man fainting from fear, and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then in Luke 21, 27, It describes Jesus' return to the earth. There it says, Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Once again, it's important to note that from Luke 21.8 through Luke 21.20, Jesus uses the personal pronoun you ten times as he speaks directly to his disciples who are on earth during this time. But when he refers to the people who will see him coming on the clouds in Luke 21.27, he switches to the pronoun they, just as he did in Matthew chapter 24, 30 and Mark 13, 26. This confirms for us for the third time that it will be people who are not his disciples who will see him coming on the clouds. Even though the rapture is not described in Luke 21, this passage is consistent with the fact that the rapture will occur at the second coming of Christ. The disciples of Jesus are on the earth from Luke 21.8 through 21.20. But it is people who are not his disciples who will see him coming on the clouds in Luke 21.27. Because his disciples will be removed from the earth in the rapture. Let's now update our combined sequence of events at the rapture and include the scripture references from Mark 13 and Luke 21. We'll take a look at the combined sequence of events at the rapture with scripture references from all the passages in the Bible that describe the rapture. We see a list of these verses here, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15, Daniel chapter 12, Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. 
Number one, there will be a time of distress such as has never occurred since there was a nation until that time. As you can see, that's described in the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 1. Also, Matthew 24, 21 through 22. And again, as you see here, Mark 13, verse 19. Number two, after the tribulation of those days, the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Confirmation of that is Matthew 24, verse 29, under the glorious return. Describes the powers of the heavens being shaken there. Mark 13, 24 through 25 also. And Luke 21, 25 through 26. And number three, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the tribes of the earth will mourn. We see that mentioned in Matthew 24, 30. It's important to keep in mind that from this point on, some events will happen very quickly, almost simultaneously, in the twinkling of an eye. Number four, Jesus will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God. That's confirmed at 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. And the last trumpet will sound is mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, where it says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. And also corresponding to that is the rapture mentioned in Revelation 11, verse 15, where the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. A description of the seventh trumpet and the rapture there. All the people of God who have already died will be raised from the dead at the seventh trumpet and receive their new immortal bodies. Again, Revelation 11.18 speaks of the resurrection. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. 1 Corinthians 15.52. And then Daniel chapter 12, verse 2 also confirms that. Number seven, Christians, everyone whose name is in the book of life, still on earth when this event occurs, will be instantly changed from their perishable bodies to their new immortal bodies. This is explained in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52. Number eight, both groups, that is, the dead in Christ who are raised imperishable, And those who are still alive and instantly changed will be caught up together in the clouds to meet Jesus in the air. That's supported in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17. And again, the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 1, where it mentions the rescue there. Number nine, the angels will gather together his elect from one end of the sky to the other and also from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of the heavens. That's confirmed in Matthew 24, 31, and again in Mark 13, verse 27. Number 10, the people who are not Jesus' disciples who are left on earth after the rapture will see the Son of Man coming with power and great glory. This is confirmed for us in Matthew 24, 30, Mark 13, verse 26, and again in Luke 21, verse 27. Number 11, there will be great destruction poured out upon the people remaining, just like in the days of Noah and Lot. Matthew 24, 37 through 39 confirms this, and also Luke 17, 26 through 27, and Luke 17, 29 through 30. Number 12, after this event, the people of God will serve with Christ as kings and priests on the earth during the millennial age, and then for all eternity. So that's supported in Revelation 5, verse 10, and 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17. Now a few of the conclusions that we found from Mark 13 and Luke 21. Number one, Jerusalem will be surrounded by armies and subsequently trampled underfoot by the Gentiles for 42 months or three and a half years. This is what the Bible refers to as Jacob's trouble. Number two, At the rapture, when the angels gather together the elect, they gather from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of heaven. And finally, number three, the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah and the days of Lot. After the believers are taken up in the rapture, destruction will come upon those who remain. And you can find this in Revelation chapter 16, which describes the seven bowls of God's wrath that are to be poured out upon the wicked. 
So this is the wrath that Christians will not have to experience. Okay, so this concludes our analysis of the rapture passages in the Bible. From the content of these passages, it's absolutely clear beyond any doubt that the rapture will occur after the tribulation at the parousia of the Son of Man, which is the same event as the parousia of the Lord, which is the same event commonly referred to as the second coming of Christ. The Bible never ever speaks of a secret coming of Jesus to rapture his church seven years before the return of Christ, as the pre-tribulation rapture suggests. Okay, so we're going to move on now to take a closer look at what the Bible calls the tribulation period. Now that we've completed our examination of the rapture passages in the Bible, and we know now clearly that there's only one rapture when Christ returns, we can shed new light on the broader subject of the end times, beginning with the period commonly referred to as the tribulation. For the purposes of this study, the phrase the tribulation specifically refers to the period of time and the events described in chapters 6 through 20 in the book of Revelation. This also corresponds to the period of time and events described by Jesus from Matthew chapter 24 verse 5 through Matthew 24 verse 31. An important question we need to ask here is, what initiates the tribulation period? There's some confusion about that. One of the more widely accepted teachings about the tribulation is that the rapture will be the event that initiates the tribulation period on the earth. According to this teaching, the massive global event, when millions of Christians will be instantly snatched away from the earth in some secret rapture, will throw the world into chaos, initiating the tribulation period on the earth. However, after examining the rapture passages in the Bible, our conclusion is that the rapture will not occur before the tribulation, but after the tribulation, at the second coming of Christ. So then, the rapture will not be the event that initiates the tribulation period on earth. The question then becomes, how will the tribulation begin? Will there be a specific identifiable event on earth that will mark the beginning of the tribulation period? Remember, the tribulation period is a seven-year period. In Matthew 24, 4-8 and Mark 13, 5-8, Jesus tells us that the tribulation will not begin with a massive global event, but rather with a series of events he compares to the beginning of birth pangs. According to Jesus, the early signs of the tribulation and the end of the age will be false Christs, wars, earthquakes, famines, and plagues in various places. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. So there will not be one specific event on earth that will mark the beginning of this tribulation period, but rather there will be a series of events that will build up and increase in frequency and intensity over time, like birth pangs. The early signs of the tribulation described by Jesus in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 correspond almost identically with events described in chapter 6 of the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 5, there is no indication of anything happening on earth that would be considered a tribulation. There is no mention of plagues, famines, earthquakes, and wars. Then, in Revelation 6 verse 1, the Lamb, Christ, opens the book with seven seals, and the first signs of tribulation are released upon the earth. Revelation 6 verse 1 and 2, under the first seal, rider on the white horse, it says, Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, As with a voice of thunder, Come. I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. The first seal in Revelation 6 1 represents a false Christ. He rides a white horse, but has only one crown instead of many crowns, and he does not act like the true Christ. He has a bow and goes out conquering and to conquer. This perfectly matches the very first sign of the tribulation that Jesus mentions in Matthew 24, verse 5. There it says, For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. 
So we know the Antichrist is going to mislead many people, including many Christians. The second seal in Revelation 6.3 is a rider on a red horse, and it is granted to take peace away from the earth. Revelation 6, verses 3 through 4, under the second seal, war, says, When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come, and another, a red horse, went out. And to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth, and that men would slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. This corresponds directly with the second sign of the tribulation stated by Jesus in Matthew 24, 6 through 7 where Jesus said, You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened. For those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. The third seal in Revelation 6 verse 5 is a black horse with a rider carrying scales to measure a quart of wheat for a denarius which was a day's wage in the Apostle John's day. This third seal represents famine. Revelation 6, 5 through 6 says, When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come. I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not damage the oil and the wine. The fourth seal in Revelation 6-7 is a rider on an ashen horse, whose name is Death, and Hades follows after him. These two will have authority to kill with the sword, famine, pestilence, and wild beasts. There it says, under the fourth seal, Death. When the Lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the four living creatures saying, Come, I looked and behold an ashen horse, and he who sat on it had the name Death, and Hades was following with him. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine, with pestilence, and by the wild beasts of the earth. The third and fourth seals correspond very well with Matthew 24, 6-7, where he says, You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. Jesus describes these early signs in Matthew 24 as the beginning of birth pangs. They match almost perfectly with the first four seals of Revelation chapter 6. The next sign is in Matthew 24 verse 9, where Jesus said, Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. This corresponds perfectly with the very next seal, the fifth seal of Revelation 6 verse 9, which represents martyrs. There in Revelation 6, 9 through 10, it says, When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? It's important to note that the early signs of the tribulation specifically mentioned by Jesus in Matthew 24, 5-9 and Mark 13, 6-13 correspond almost identically with the first five seals in Revelation chapter 6 which represent the first events in the tribulation period. The point is, the Bible does not note a specific event on earth that sets these things in motion. The event that initiates the tribulation happens in heaven when the Lamb, Jesus, opens the book with seven seals in Revelation 6.1. The conclusion is that there will not be one specific event on the earth that will mark the beginning of the seven-year tribulation period. However, the Bible does give us a marker for when the Great Tribulation begins. The Bible speaks of a tribulation and a Great Tribulation, so we need to be aware of that. The Tribulation period will begin with a series of events that build up and increase in frequency and intensity over time, like birth pangs. The Great Tribulation, however, begins with the revealing of the Antichrist and will last three and a half years 
according to prophecy from Revelation and the book of Daniel, and Jesus' reference to the abomination of desolation in the book of Matthew, at Matthew 24, verse 15, where he says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Here, Jesus was referring to the prophecy in Daniel chapter 9 regarding the 70 weeks. So let's touch on that prophecy briefly here. Daniel 9, starting in the 24th verse, it says, Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after the sixty-two weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing, and the people of the Prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with the flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. I will assume that most of you are already familiar with this prophecy of Daniel's 70 weeks, so I will just touch on it briefly here as sort of a reminder. Number one, the 70 weeks refer to 490 years and speak of the future of Israel and Jerusalem beginning with a decree given to Nehemiah and ending with the final and complete cleansing of Israel's sins at the second coming of Christ. Number two, the 70 weeks are divided into three periods, as you see here. You have seven weeks, 62 weeks, and one week, which totals 490 years. Number three, the first two periods ran out during the lifetime of Christ, where the Bible says, unto Messiah the Prince, and before his death on the cross. Number four, the death of Christ would follow or occur after the 69 weeks ended, but not in the 70th week. Number five, the 70th week predicts the appearing of the prince that shall come, the little horn, or Antichrist, and his seven-year relationship to Daniel's people in the seven years preceding Christ's second coming. So that would be the final 70th week there. This period of seven years is divided into two parts. The first half seeing a covenant made with the Jews, the Jewish sacrifices resuming in a new rebuilt third temple. And the second half seeing the covenant broken, the sacrifices stopped, and an abomination of some sort set up that will begin worldwide desolations. Jesus interpreted that to mean the great tribulation such as has never been. However, the desolator, this Antichrist, will come to his end and the six great blessings will be fulfilled, including the bringing in of everlasting righteousness or the kingdom of God being established on the earth. The last week of Daniel's prophecy of the 70th weeks has a gap in it, and the gap interpretation is based on these following points. Point number one, the fact that there is no seven-year period in the Bible or history which has fulfilled this last seven-year unit of Daniel's prophecy. Number two, if the 70th week immediately followed the 69th, if it began with Christ's death on the cross in 33 AD, seven years after his ascension, there is no great event recorded that showed that this was fulfilled. Number three, Jesus specifically stated that general signs would occur through the ages, including the last one of preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God to all the world. He continued by saying, Then shall the end come, and immediately brought up when you see the abomination spoken by Daniel standing in the holy place. We thus know Jesus is equating the abomination of Daniel with the end of this age, anticipated by Jesus and the book of Revelation. And Revelation was written at least 60 years 
after the death of Christ and 20 years after the destruction of Jerusalem. So we know that this prophecy applies to the last days of this evil age. Number four, the evil prince will enter into a covenant with Daniel's people, an unholy alliance that will bring ruin to Israel. In the middle of the seven-year period, this one who confirms the covenant will break it by putting a stop to the sacrifice and grain offering and establish a significant event known as the abomination of desolation on God's holy mount in God's temple. It is clear that sacrifices cannot be stopped and a temple desecrated unless both are in existence. Such an end-time temple is taught in Revelations chapter 11, 1 through 2, and in 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. And Daniel also said the sanctuary shall be destroyed in Daniel 9, verse 26. How could the sanctuary be destroyed unless it existed? So most people are expecting this third temple to be rebuilt before the end comes. The last half of verse 27 of Daniel 9 says, And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering, and on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. This verse apparently describes the desecration of the temple. We also must notice that Daniel specifically speaks three times of the sacrifice being abolished and the abomination of desolation in Daniel chapter 12, Daniel chapter 11, and here in Daniel 9 verse 27. Around 500 years after Daniel predicted this, Jesus Christ said, When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, then there will be a great tribulation. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the sign of Christ will appear, and then all the tribes of the earth shall mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. So Jesus here explained that Daniel's prediction of the abolished sacrifices and the setting up of the abomination in the temple would be events immediately happening just before and in connection with his second coming. So Jesus explained that this abomination set up in the holy place would be the start of the great tribulation, and that after that tribulation the sun would be darkened and he would return. Numerous places indicate that the coming great tribulation will last three and a half years, after which Jesus will come. Jesus, in his teaching, places this prophecy of Daniel at the end of this age. We must agree that the 70th week belongs to a seven-year relationship between the Antichrist and Daniel's people Israel, an eschatological or final end times, and concludes with the second coming of Christ. This Antichrist is the one who will take away the sacrifice mentioned at Daniel 8.11 and will stand up against the prince of princes, an obvious reference to Jesus in Daniel 8.25. The Antichrist is the one who will speak great words against the Most High and wear out the saints of the Most High, and they shall be given into his hand until the time, times, and the dividing of the time mentioned in Daniel 7.25, a period of three and a half years. Clearly, there are Christians being killed by the Antichrist during these three and a half years of the Antichrist rule. Again, the rapture is the resurrection of all faithful people of God, so there can be no Christians dying after the rapture because it is the end of death, as 1 Corinthians 15.54 shows. There it says, But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. But the pre-tribulation doctrine teaches that Christians called tribulation saints will still be dying after the supposedly secret rapture. But as we have learned from the Bible, there is only one rapture or parousia, which comes after the tribulation and not before it. So the Antichrist in the Bible is also called the Assyrian six times by the prophet Isaiah and the prophet Micah, who will be a person and power coming from the Syria-Iraq region of the Middle East. 
The Apostle Paul calls him the man of sin, and Revelation calls him the beast, who along with the false prophet will be given authority over all who dwell on the earth for three and a half years. During the last three and a half years of this evil age, just before Christ returns, there will be a worldwide time of desolations. The city and the sanctuary will be destroyed. Jerusalem and the temple will be demolished and ruined. Jeremiah, the prophet, calls this the time of Jacob's trouble, as I mentioned earlier. You can also find this referred to at Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Yet this trouble and destruction shall affect all on the earth. For Jesus said, if these days are not shortened, no life will be saved. This will be a time when many saints or righteous people, Christians who follow Christ, will be overcome by anti-Christian forces. This is confirmed at Daniel chapter 7, verse 21, where he says, I kept looking, and that horn, the Antichrist, was waging war with the saints and overpowering them. Also in Revelation 13, verse 7, it says that the people of God, the saints, will be overcome by the Antichrist during the end times. If the saints are all raptured from the earth, this could not be possible. There, Revelation 13, 7 it was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. This is the time when no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, name, or number of the beast, as is stated in Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 and 17. Even to the end of this time there will be war, Daniel 9:26 tells us. This desolation is likened to a flood covering the earth, a desolation that shall overflow the whole earth. Daniel later in Daniel chapter 2, 1 explained it this way, where he says there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And Jesus supported this idea in Matthew twenty four twenty one, where he says there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever shall. The last three and a half years of the tribulation ends with complete destruction of this desolator, the Antichrist. So make no mistake, the Bible clearly teaches that Christians will be alive on earth during the Antichrist rule and will suffer great persecution. The gathering of the church to Jesus at his second coming promised in 2 Thessalonians 2.1, will not occur until after this man of sin is revealed. There it says, Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, is revealed, the son of destruction. We've learned that the Antichrist is going to be revealed three and a half years into the tribulation period, which starts the Great Tribulation. 2 Thessalonians 2.1 tells us that Jesus will not return to rapture the church until after the Antichrist is revealed deep into the Great Tribulation. That fact alone shows that a pre-tribulation rapture is a false teaching, not based on the Bible. Again, this is a post-tribulation resurrection. Okay, I'm going to end this video here, but stay tuned for my next video in this series, Part 5 where we will take a close look at the false teaching of imminency as taught by pre-tribulationists to see if that is actually taught in the Bible. So stay tuned for that, and as always, thank you very much for watching.